Today on the Bander Says Podcast, we're going to talk about YouTube removing some auto-post features, YouTube's profanity monetization policy, a couple of new microphone announcements, and a whole lot more, so go ahead and stick around. Greetings, Earthlings, and welcome back to episode 150 Deuce of the BSP. My name is Bandrew. This is what I says. Like always, down below, there are timestamps of everything that I talk about so you can skip around and save a couple of minutes. But if you got the time, I would appreciate you and downright love you if you would check out the entire episode. Now, if you do want a different version of the show, you can find all the stuff at bandrewsays.com. Let's jump right into it. And the first thing is YouTube is killing some auto post features. YouTube announced that after January 31st, the ability to auto share YouTube actions, i.e. uploads or liked videos on Twitter and Google Plus will no longer be available. Now, I do want to point out that you will still be able to manually share the videos that you like or manually share the videos that you update. There is still the share to social media button. The only feature that is being removed is the feature that allows you to automatically share to Google Plus or Twitter where it says this person liked this video and it shares a link to the video on Twitter or podcast has uploaded a new video to Twitter. Now, YouTube also stated their reasoning as many years ago, we introduced the option to automatically post your public YouTube activity with your social media followers on both Twitter and Google+. Since then, we found that social sharing works better when the message is more customized and takes advantage of social media features such as at mentions. Overall, this provides a better experience for both you and your followers versus automatically generated posts. I have seen a couple of YouTube creators get kind of upset about this, saying that it's going to hurt the distribution or the discoverability of their videos, but I actually agree with YouTube here. The reason I agree with YouTube is these posts that are going to Twitter are very clear that they are automatically generated, and I cannot imagine that anybody has said, oh, person XY974249 or actually liked this video by YouTube or by podcastage on YouTube, I'm going to go ahead and check it out. I don't think that has ever happened, at least not recently. They don't even tag you in these automatically generated posts anymore, so I don't really see a benefit to it. Now, I do maybe understand, oh, well, now I have to manually post my videos to Twitter. Yeah, you do. And I think that will ultimately yield a much higher conversion rate for you because you're able to add a custom thumbnail, you're able to format it properly for Twitter rather than YouTube saying, oh, you know, these specs that we used four or five years ago to create these automatically generated posts. That's still what we're using. Now you're able to make it fit a lot more, make it more appealing and make it more native to the actual platform that you're posting to, which in my opinion will lead to a much, much better conversion rate. So that is my take on it. And I will go ahead and link two articles from Google support team in the show notes down below. Next, I want to talk about profanity on YouTube in your videos and titles and thumbnails and how that affects your monetizability, for lack of a better word, or your ability to monetize. The Creator Insider channel released a short four minute video about how profanity actually affects your monetization. And of course, I will link that video in the show notes and description down below. But a very quick summary. YouTube will look at the title, the thumbnail, and how much profanity is used at the beginning of the video. They really did emphasize the beginning of the video when they were talking about how they determine if they're going to monetize or demonetize your video. Now, I'm assuming that this is because at the beginning of the video, that is where the majority of advertisements play. The majority of ads on YouTube seem to be pre-roll ads. And this entire strategy or policy rather is based on what advertisers want. So why would they not want profanity at the beginning of the video? Because they don't want their ad to end and then go right into effing effing S S my B. I hate these effing effers. I don't think they want that because some people may think, oh, well, this advertiser is directly supporting this type of language. 
this type of profanity. We don't want that. We don't want to support this company anymore. So to me, it seems like advertisers saying, we understand that people are so stupid (laughs) that we're going to make people not swear within a certain time frame after our advertisement plays. With that being said, I do think that if you believe in this theory that I have, that if you put mid-roll ads in your video, you should also not swear after that. You should go ahead and leave a couple of minutes if you do decide to swear. Another option here would be just to bleep out every single swear. That is perfectly fine. Or you could just say, frickin' heck, aw hell, aw gee gosh darn willikers. That is all fine. One thing that I did find interesting in this video though, you cannot say racial slurs for obvious reasons, very offensive, but even if you bleep a racial slur, I don't know how they would determine if you are saying a racial slur and bleeping it out, but you are not able to even bleep out a racial slur and still be monetized. I'm assuming it's based on the context of what is being said in the video. But that is very important to know. First off, you probably shouldn't be saying racial slurs. But just so you know, if you are a a complete dickhead, then you can't even bleep it. (laughs) You're you're still not going to be able to make money. So take that, you dicks. Uh, (laughs) So what can you do with this story or how should you adjust your content strategy here? First and foremost, don't include swearing in the title or the thumbnail. I don't think that's a a controversial stand to take. Don't put the F word in your thumbnail. Don't put swear words in the title. Pretty straightforward. Another option is if you do curse a lot, consider bleeping it out or just don't start swearing until the middle of the video, assuming that you don't have any mid-roll ads. And I think just give maybe a, this is completely arbitrary, I am guessing, maybe 50% into your video, or I would say a couple minutes after an advertisement, don't start swearing, but maybe I should reach out to YouTube or Yugle. I almost called him (laughs) Yugle. YouTube and Google, Yugle. Maybe I'll reach out to them, but I'll go ahead and link that video in the show notes down below. Next, we got somewhat of a competitor to YouTube. Not in the way you're thinking, but they're also a competitor to Netflix and Hulu. That would be IMDb, the Internet Movie Database. What? (laughs) That's right. IMDb, the place that you look up actors and find out what they've been in, has now launched a free streaming service that is ad supported, just like YouTube. It is called Free Dive. Now, there are some pretty good films on there, as well as some IMDb originals, which seems like original content based around the analysis of movies which makes sense, but I didn't even realize those were a thing. So I didn't realize that IMDb was making original content, that they had a, a film crew and a, a bunch of, of hosts. Interesting stuff. I went through a bunch of the films on there and I found a few selections if you want to check them out. And then I will link the free service in the show notes. First, I got Prom Night. That is Jamie Lee Curtis. And it's about Prom Night and a murderer. Then we got Idle Hands with Devin Sawa and, oh, I can't remember her name, Jessica Alba. That movie is hilarious. I love that movie. A lot of people don't like it. A lot of people think, oh, that's a stupid horror comedy. It's not even funny. I love it. It's very good. Then there's Gattaca. Just a great sci-fi film. Stranger Than Fiction. I think one of Will Ferrell's best performances. And the story is just fascinating. It also has Queen Latifah in it. Very cool. And Buster from what's that show? I can't remember right now. And then the last one is Dracula, the one with Keanu Reeves and Gary Oldman. So go check that out. Seems pretty awesome that these websites and these services are starting to realize, hey, we can go ahead and support these movies with ads. They will get seen. People can watch them for free and they'll just have to sit through it like it's being broadcast on television. Very Very cool. Now we got a piece of Apple news, and it would be that iTunes is going to be on Samsung TVs. So at CES, it was announced this week that iTunes and AirPlay 2 will be available on Samsung's TVs in 2019. And the thing that's notable here is this is the first time that 
iMovie, not iMovie, that iTunes and Apple Movies or whatever has been available on platforms outside of Apple and outside of a Windows PC. Previously, it was not available anywhere. There was some severe ecosystem lock-in. Now, Samsung has been known to have some tracking on their TVs, like a lot of these smart TVs, which is why they're able to sell them so cheap, if I am not mistaken. They just say, yeah, we'll sell it to you for, does $300 sound good? Okay, go ahead and connect it to the internet. Yeah, let us see what you're watching. Ooh, that's some, that's some tasty data. Let me go ahead and sell this off. That's how it works. <laughs> now, so Samsung does have that capability or they have that feature. Should we call it a feature? So Apple, being the privacy and security focused company that they are, or at least that's the front they put on, they stated that while watching content in the iTunes app, Samsung will be unable to see this information and be unable to track you. How awesome is that? So in my opinion, this announcement is good on all fronts. The reasons Less ecosystem lock-in, as I just mentioned, meaning that the options for more devices will yield a better experience for the consumer, and it will lead to more options. So people may be able to get a better television and not have to invest an extra 100 or 150 bucks in an Apple TV. So that is very good for the consumer. Additionally, there's going to be a secure option to watch movies on the Samsung e ecosystem, which is going to allow more people the option to remain secure while getting a lower cost TV or not having to purchase an Apple TV, like I just mentioned. And lastly, this is great for Apple for obvious reasons. This opens the iTunes and their movie platform to a whole new marketplace and audience of people who had probably zero desire to buy an Apple TV. People probably weren't going to do that because the Samsung Smart TV has everything that they need. It has Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, whatever. So they had no need for an Apple TV. By Apple getting in there, that opens them up to that entire market if they do want a slightly more secure option. Additionally, they have their TV service coming in 2019. So this will allow a larger number of people to potentially access it. There was a rumor last year that this Apple TV service would only be available on Apple devices and it would be free to access. And maybe that will still be the case. But I personally see this being, okay, if you have an Apple device, like an Apple TV, where you have paid us for that hardware, you will get free access. And then if you want access on a Samsung TV or a Windows PC, then they may charge you a subscription fee. Maybe. That is what I am guessing will happen here. But all in all, I think this is great for Apple, the consumer, and maybe for Samsung. Sure. We'll go. Sure. It's good for Samsung, I guess. I don't, I don't know why, but there it is. Next, we got the Ring camera could be watched by employees talking about tracking and watching what you're doing. You know that Ring doorbell that has a camera in it that is owned by Amazon and a company that also has other security cameras that you place in your house to watch people and make sure that nobody's breaking in and stealing your stuff? Well, they apparently allowed certain employees to view unencrypted video files and live feeds from certain customers' cameras. I should note that Ring came out and said we have never given access to live feeds to any of our employees. So take with that what you will. Some people are saying they did have access. And then the company itself is saying, no, we did not give access to live video feeds. They didn't say we didn't give access to unencrypted videos, though. So with that being said, the company moved from the U.S. to the Ukraine and they gave the R&D department access to a folder with every customer's unencrypted video files, as well as a database that linked each video to the customer that the video belonged to. That is insane. But the justification that Ring gave, gave out is that it was done to manually tag and label objects due to insufficient AI. And they did this in attempts to train the AI to locate faces, locate people, locate cars, locate all sorts of different objects. That's what they did. They promised these AI functions and the AI functions were not there. 
So <laughs> they breached your privacy and your security, maybe not security, but your privacy and let people watch your video feeds that were recorded. They were not live, according to, to Ring, so they could give you those AI functions. But it's not AI. It's I guess it would be AI. It's actual intelligence. It's HI, human intelligence. Hey, that's a person. Let me go ahead and tag it. That's what happened. They, they, I, I don't know. That's insane. Ring did release a statement saying they only sourced videos from publicly shared Ring videos from the Neighbors app, which according to them is okayed when you agree to their terms of service. And I'll leave it there. The moral of this is be very careful what you put in your house, especially if there's a camera, especially if that video is being recorded somewhere. Something with a a security shield, a cover for the camera that you can turn on or off may be a good idea, or maybe we don't need it. I don't know. It's nice to have security, but it's also terrifying the the invasion of privacy that comes along with that since it's all being stored remotely. Although that gives you the ability to, for, to actually store the video. If somebody breaks in and you're storing all the footage locally, they can scrub that or they can steal the server with all that video footage on it. So it's, it really is a give and take. Just be careful. Now we're going to jump to a bunch of new products. There is a lot. I'm not going to talk about a lot of them. I'm going to talk about a couple. First up is Yubico is launching a Lightning two-factor authentication token. Now, I, by now, I think everybody who listens and watches this knows that I am an advocate for having two-factor authentication turned on everything if it is available, and I would prefer to have physical two-factor authentication like this YubiKey that I am holding in my hand. There is a big issue with iOS or, yeah, iOS devices. Does not have USB-C and does not have NFC, near field communication, which are both features that YubiKey has come out with in the past to allow for physical two-factor authentication. So as an iOS user, you've been SOL in terms of physical authentication. No, 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 not anymore. YubiKey came out and said that they are going to be releasing a version that has both a USB-C on one side, so you can use it for your MacBook or anything, as well as a lightning adapter on the other side. So you're even feature-proofed a little bit because chances are eventually Apple's going to kill the lightning and move to USB-C. I'll just flip that little stick around and then you got the, the USB-C port. And that's about it. They are already working on it and they've already provided code that companies can include in their apps to allow for this physical two-factor authentication. Currently, it's only in private preview and there's no release date announced. But all in all, I am very excited. Get on it, YubiKey if you, or Yubico. If you want a tester, go ahead and send me one. I would love to, assuming that applications actually install your code. I would love that. Next, we got a new microphone from Blue, the Blue Ember. That's right. Blue announced a new microphone called the Ember. Ember, not Ember, Ember. And it's going to cost $100. And on one site, I saw a release date of January 23rd, 2019. Let's talk about the specs briefly. Cardioid polar pattern, frequency response of 38 to 20 kilohertz, sensitivity, negative 38 and a half, impedance, 40 ohms, max SPL, 100, 132 decibels, and there's no self-noise spec. Additionally, there's no frequency response graph out there, so we can't get any general idea of how it will sound. However, I did pull a listing of their lineup of microphones in this family and how they describe them, and they describe the Spark as detailed and transparent sound, the Bluebird as modern crystal clear, the baby bottle as detailed and transparent, and they say the ember is open and detailed sound. With that information, there's not much that we can decipher in terms of the tone of the microphone, but based on how they describe other microphones and the characteristics of those mics, I'm going to go ahead and speculate that we'll see a, a quite significant boost in the treble and air frequencies on this microphone, and that will give us a very detailed and open sound. There you have it. 
That's it. I'll link the product page for Blue in the show notes if you want to check it out. Next, we got, oh God, this one's stupid. We got the HyperX Quadcast. That's right, HyperX. The company that makes some of my favorite gaming headsets. The, my favorite gaming headphones, not, not necessarily the microphone, but the headphones are some of my favorite for gaming. They're releasing it's their first standalone USB microphone. Guess what? It's going to have four polar patterns. It's going to have a mute button. Very cool. And it's going to have LED lighting. Awesome. It's going to cost 140 bucks and it's coming out March of 2019. Why four polar patterns, I ask? Why are all these companies simply copying what Blue did with the Yeti? I understand the Yeti is popular. That doesn't mean that all microphones should copy that, especially if it's mainly for gamers. You are a gaming company. There is zero need for four polar patterns. Just give us a good cardioid polar pattern and focus on making everything else good. <coughs> you do not need to spend additional money adding two microphone capsules in there so you can provide four polar patterns. Knock out one of those polar patterns, rather capsules, focus on the other internals, get as good headphone amps, good A to D converters, and move on. Don't give us four polar patterns. No gamer is ever going to need that. That is stupid. That's my take on it. I don't know. I, I, I'll never understand. Why four polar patterns? I don't get it. And the last thing, there's not much information here, but Samson announced the satellite. This is going to be a USB iOS microphone, 24 bit, 96 kilohertz. It is a condenser. And there are three polar patterns, cardioid, figure eight, omnidirectional, and there is zero latency monitoring. I'm not as mad about this because they are not a gaming company. They are not marketing this as a gaming microphone. It's more of a music microphone or a broadcast microphone. I understand cardioid for broadcast and I understand figure eight for broadcast. Of course, Omni is useful if you go to a lot of meetings, you need to record everything going on. Not going to be useful for a typical one or two person podcast, but it is there in case somebody wants to misuse it for their podcast. Podcast. I keep getting comments about how I say it, and it cracks me up every time. Somebody said, I'm shutting off this video. The way he says podcast is so annoying. Okay, <laughs> bye. That's that's it for the news and the new products. Now we're going to jump into what you had to say. And the first comment comes from Kragatar. He says, the new mic sounds good, clean and easy to listen to. Weird design though, looks a bit impractical. Kragatar, I agree with you. The design of this microphone is bizarre. I don't know why they decided to do this. The right angle on the rear seems a bit, I don't know. I don't know how I would describe it. It is just weird. It is funky looking. I don't know what I feel about it. As far as the sound, was easy to listen to. Clear, I agree. I did get comments. Not very good with plosives, is it? In it. Pretty bad with plosives, in it. I agree. Hence the pop filter. So this week I am going to be adding more EQ, trying to tune it a bit more to my preference to see what kind of sound we can get out of it. But all in all, pretty decent microphone so far. I'm going to reserve any additional statements about how I feel about it for another week or so. I want to get a better feel for it with the processing that I will use on it. Next comment comes from American Liberty. He says, when uploading a podcast, can you specifically deny a service such as Spotify from using your content? I mean, if they are destroying your presentation quality, is it worth using their platform? That is an excellent, excellent question. And I will say, yes, it is. First off, in order to be listed in Spotify, in their app, in their podcast segment, you have to submit your podcast manually to be accepted into their database or their, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is, into their directory. That's the word. And because of that, you can deny Spotify the right to your content just by not submitting to be in their directory. Problem solved. But I do think that even though they degrade the audio quality a little bit, that there is enough value in there to 
justify submitting into their directory and allowing them to degrade your audio a bit. I say that because Spotify is a very, very popular music streaming service. It is not well known for podcasts, and I don't believe... I would guess, I would speculate that the majority of Spotify listeners are not huge podcast consumers. They are more music consumers. That means that the majority of users of Spotify are perfect for new podcasters who are looking for a new audience because they don't know of any on Spotify. Very few know of podcasts on Spotify. Because of that, if you're in the Spotify directory, you could be that show that does it for them, that introduces them to what podcasts are, that becomes their new favorite show. So that is why I believe that even though they do degrade the audio quality and maybe they'll throw in dynamic ads, I don't know what the the rules there would be if they have to give you any of that advertising revenue. But even if they do that, I do think there's enough value. I am personally not seeing a huge number of downloads and growth from the platform from Spotify directly, but I'm seeing a couple here and there, and that's enough for me to say, okay, I'll go ahead and keep it in there. I won't pull it out just because they destroy the audio quality. So very good question. Hope that helps. The last comment comes from Avocado Atrocity. Your phone tracks you. Your car tracks you. See Tesla. Your purchases track you. If only this was the conspiracy corner. Avocado. Ask and ye shall receive. Welcome to the Conspiracy Corner. It's been a while since we've been here. It's a little bit musty. <sighs> Blowing off the dust on everything. Bit bit out of hand over here. <laughs> so, as far as Teslas, I don't own a Tesla. I don't have to worry about that. How much money do you think I'm making off of this YouTube racket? <laughs> it's not enough to afford a Tesla. As far as the phones tracking you, I agree 100%. Phones are tracking you everywhere that you go. That is why I am so excited about the Purism Librem 5, not sponsored. I <laughs> feel like I need to, to point that out every time because I talk so highly about it. And yes, banks track you, stores track you based on your purchases. They aggregate that data and they sell it off. So maybe it's time to go back to an all-cash system where we only purchase stuff with cash or we buy a dumb phone with a prepaid credit card and, and don't do it. I don't know. Let's get out of here. This isn't much of a conspiracy. It's just fact. And it's dusty. It's moldy in here. There's black mold, I think. I don't like the conspiracy corner right now. I feel it a little bit ill. <laughs> all right. So with all of that, yeah, I agree with everything that you've you've said. Cars can track you. Phones can track you. Your bank tracks you. Stores track you. Your credit card company tracks you. We're doomed. There's almost nothing we can do to escape it, but we should still try to escape it. Now, that's it for what you had to say. Let's jump to my favorite part of the podcast, the Ask Pedro segment. (music) Greetings, Earthlings. Welcome back to... That's not, why did I go into the intro of this show? What is wrong with me? Did I just have a stroke? Why did, hey, welcome to the Ask Bander segment. Let's go with that. If you have any questions, Jesus Christ, send them to askbander at gmail.com and I will likely answer them on an upcoming episode of the podcast, assuming that I don't have a hemorrhage in my brain and die because it seems like that's what's happening right now. Jesus. First email comes from Emil. Hi, really love your channel. Very helpful. I'm starting a home studio for my music, folk style. I can't decide between the Rode NT1A and the Blue Spark, red slash orange one. What do you think? I need help to decide. Ha ha. I don't have an isolated booth slash room, so I need a microphone that shuts down the noise. Many thanks. Emil. Emil, thank you for the email or email. Thank you for the email. <laughs> Your name's very similar to email. Kind of confusing. I'm sorry. I will start by saying you won't get a tremendous amount of noise rejection with either of those microphones. 
they both do pick up quite a bit of ambient noise as well as reverb. So that's not going to be a tremendous amount of noise reduction with either of those microphones. If it's actual noise, i.e. noise outside of your room, like a noisy road, these microphones won't necessarily do anything to remove that. I think you would be better or best served by getting some sound blankets, covering the windows, doing something to isolate the room. Moving blankets can help a bit. You can get some very cheap acoustic foam to help with that. That won't do much with soundproofing. Or you could do what I did to pay off a recording. You could fill walls with sand. <laughs> That's what we did. We couldn't afford a final day of recording back in the back in my day. And in order to pay off an additional day, we we helped them build artificial walls and fill them with sand to deaden the sound. I, I wouldn't recommend it, but you could do that. If it's reverb, again, I think I think you could get some moving blankets, but for folk music, I don't necessarily think that is a terrible thing. Folk music is, forgive me for sounding hippie, it's it's a much more raw form of expression, man. It's totally a raw form of expression, man. And I, I think the room can add a bit more character to it as long as it's not a terrible sounding room in terms of reverb. I think you should be good there adds a little bit of life to it. It gives people a sense of the atmosphere that you're in when you're recording. Now, there is some downsides to that. Once the reverb's in there, there's nothing you can do about it. You can't change the reverb in post. If you have a completely dead room, then yeah, you could do that in post. So I think the best course of action for you would be in terms of the room. Maybe pick up some moving blankets. Those will help dampen the outside sound a little bit. If you cover your windows with them, it will also help dampen a little bit of the reverb. Won't do the best job because it is absorption rather than diffusion. And typically you want to marry the two, both absorption and diffusion, to decrease the amount of reverb going on. As far as the microphones, I think you would be fine with either. While I looked at them, it does seem like the NT1A has a slightly less pronounced boost in the high end. And I think more boosted high ends, a lot of the brighter microphones are a current trend and it sounds very modern. And when I think of folk music, I don't think, man, I would love this folk music to sound modern. I would love to be as crispy as anybody's business. I've never thought that about folk music. I like more natural sounding recordings for folk, more authentic, more realistic. So I, of the two, I probably wouldn't select either. You will be fine with them. You'll be happy with them. But if I had the selection, I would probably go with a flatter microphone like the NT1. I know I sound like a broken record, but that's my take on it. Sorry, I got rambly there. That was a very long, very unorganized response. I hope that helped. Probably didn't though. Next comment, next email comes from Joel. I swear I am having a stroke. <laughs> hey, Bandrew, I was watching your Sure SM7B vs. NT1 video. So my question is, from me trying to do research to adding a new microphone to my collection, I use my microphone for hip-hop vocals at the moment and am kind of confused on what to get. I work for Best Buy and we get special discounts from Rode as a benefit. Not really important, but only saying because I could get a deal. That being said, I would like to get a great mic. Now I've been doing countless of research and have been getting a headache because I don't know what to choose from. If you can please give some insight and advice to direct me to my better choice, which would it be? The mics I was looking at was the NT1 kit, NT1A, and Rode NT2A. Sorry for the long message and thank you for responding, Joel. Thank you very much for the email. That was not a long email. That was right into the point. Personally, I have not tested or even looked at the NT2A. I did buy an NT2A and it came disassembled in the box with all the parts smashing the internals of the microphone. So I didn't even plug it in for fear of it just blowing up. I just shipped it back, said, give me a refund. And I've never heard the NT2A in my studio. I cannot recommend or not recommend it because... I know nothing about it. I haven't looked at it. 
Between the NT1 and the NT1A, I personally prefer the NT1 because it is a more neutral sounding microphone. I make no reservations about making that known. I think everybody knows I like flatter. I like darker microphones. That is my personal preference. If you don't like darker microphones or flatter or more neutral microphones, you may not like the NT1. That's up for you to decide there. But with that being said, it's likely not going to sit well in a mix unless you add some EQ to boost it over some of those other instruments going on in the mix. With hip hop, I don't think there's a lot of mids going on, depending on the instrumentation. The, the major focus is the kick drum, the, the sub bass, some hi-hats, some snares. It's more of a percussive type of music, at least to my knowledge of it. And I mean, you could add some instrumentation to get it really mid-focused, but I think you would be fine with that, throwing on some EQ. The NT1A, on the other hand, does have a presence boost built into it, which will make your vocals pop out of the rest of the mix a bit more than the NT1. With the NT1, you could just boost it in EQ. With the NT1A, if you don't like the presence boost, you can just cut it out. Reductive EQ... I don't know if there's if there's a benefit to reductive or additive EQ. I've always le leaned on the in the school of reduce the EQ rather than boost the EQ. But personally, I'd go with the NT1 kit. And there you have it. That's my take. Again, bit rambly. Sorry. And the last email comes from Roy. He says, hey, Bandrew, I found out about you. Let me just zoom in a little bit so I can read this. The stroke is making my eyesight difficult. <laughs> I found out about you a few months ago, and I've been a huge fan ever since. Thank you so much, Roy. Very kind of you. Anyways, he's got a couple of questions. If I don't mind taking a couple minutes of time. One, before he died, my dad was very into reading and recording, recorded a few audiobooks for him when he started losing his eyesight. He never really liked them, but I fell in love with the process of making them, and I've been trying to step up my game. I use a Samson Q2U, and I'm trying to make up my mind about investing in an audio interface. Is there any chance you could make a somewhat exhaustive comparison between XLR and USB quality with that microphone? I find it very hard to tell any differences when listening to videos like yours, and now I wonder if it's me who's going deaf or something like that. Two, since I only record audiobooks and upload them to YouTube, do you think there's any point in getting a webcam? I'm far from being an original content creator, and I don't really think of myself as being particularly creative, but I kind of like the idea of doing something that involves people looking at my face. I don't know. Ideas? Anyway, thank you very much for your time and for all those great lazy hours I've spent laying in bed with my PS4 playing the Banner Says podcast. P.S. I don't miss an episode, so feel free to answer this in any upcoming podcast. Thanks again. Roy, thank you very much for the email. Unfortunately, I don't think you're going to really like my answer here. So first, I will answer the first one for you. I'll start by saying that's awesome that you were making audiobooks for your father as he lost his eyesight. Sorry he didn't really seem to enjoy them based on your email, but you found a really awesome new hobby and something to fill your time and a skill to develop. So, number one, that's something I should do regarding audio quality. I will admit that. Comparing USB to XLR. The reason I haven't done it yet is that the comparison would vary quite drastically from audio interface to audio interface. Almost all interfaces have different preamps I say that because if you want to see an interesting discovery, I guess, go check Julian Krause's new video about the Behringer interfaces. Pretty interesting there. But they have the majority of interfaces have different preamps and different A to D conversion, which will all affect the sound, whether it be noise performance, whether it be coloration, whether it be anything. All these different components do affect the sound quality. So if you are comparing a USB microphone to an XLR microphone through a USB audio interface, that's really only telling you how those two audio sources compare running through that audio interface. It's not saying 
This microphone is going to sound like this through every single audio interface. Therefore, this is the benefit. It's just saying the Q2U sounds like this is USB and it sounds like this through the Steinberg UR22. That's all it's really showing you. So that's why I have not done it because the testing results would vary quite drastically. But I will admit, there's not going to be a tremendous amount of difference, especially if you're uploading to YouTube. YouTube's compression <laughs> kind of destroys most things. And a lot of benefits that you may be getting from certain preamps, certain interfaces, certain A to D converters is going to be lost because it gets compressed down when you're creating your MP4 file or whatever video file you're creating. And then when you upload it, it is getting compressed by YouTube. Therefore, I haven't done one. I don't know if I'm going to do one. Maybe I will in the future, but it just seems like a lost cause. Maybe not a lost cause. I will do it in the future. It's just finding the time. <laughs> I don't know. Your second comment, your second question. Should you get a webcam? I think webcams are very useful, but they're not necessary. As you say, you're going to be creating audio content. What I would do is say I have $200 budget or $500 budget, whatever. I am going to spend 500 bucks and get the best audio setup that I can. And then if I get the best that I can and there's still 50 bucks left over, then I'll consider buying a webcam because that will not be directly affecting or impacting your audiobook recordings. It's a webcam. It has zero impact on what your recordings sound like. The C920 though, that keeps coming down in price. And who knows, if you were to get asked to jump on a voice actor podcast or an audiobook podcast and they do video versions, you may need to have a C920. So it may be a good thing to invest in, but if it's going to limit your budget for your audio gear, which is the main focus, then I would say don't buy one just yet. Focus on the, the audio gear first. And then if you have some left over, then maybe consider picking one up. That's going to do it for today. Thank you guys so much for sticking with me through this health crisis that I am having, which would be recording myself having a stroke. Or should I say greetings, Earthlings? Welcome back to the Vander Says Podcast. It's a weird day. I'm in a weird mood. <laughs> That's going to be it. Thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you for listening. I'll talk to you next week. Ask Bandrew at gmail.com, says.com. I tip my hat to thee, fair ladder, lads and lassies. Jesus Christ. See ya! This has been a Geeks Rising production, your executive producer of Vandrew Scott. For more information, head over to www.geeksrising.com.